Oh, let's see. Okay. Um, so uh, it gives me great pleasure today to be able to help us remember our former colleague, Leo Kadanoff. Leo was one of the deepest and most creative theorists of our time. Uh, he revolutionized how we think about collective phenomena and the structure of matter. The concepts of scaling, the importance of dilation symmetry and dividing matter into what are now known as Kadanoff blocks have had enormous impact upon condensed matter uh, all the way from condensed matter to elementary particle physics. Among the many concepts that Leo introduced were two that have been crucial in quantum field theory, the operator product expansion and anomalous scaling dimensions. He also initiated investigations of dynamic critical phenomena and co-invented an elegant lattice representation of fluid mechanics that is still used today. He, Leo had great judgment about what questions were interesting and what results were important not only in statistical physics, his main subject area, but also in fluids, condensed matter, geophysics, chemistry, and engineering. Leo was a prodigious mathematical physicist, but he never lost sight of the core idea behind his calculations and could explain their significance in very physical terms. One of the things he kept telling us was that his ability to communicate was an important part of why his ideas became so broadly useful, important, and widely adopted. Here at home, Leo was the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Distinguished Service Professor in both the physics and the mathematics departments. He arrived here in 1978 and, uh, until his death in 2015. We all remember him as a mentor. He was a mentor to the students, to the postdocs who had the department, junior faculty who he was always uh, strongly supportive of, and colleagues in many other departments. We've tried to remember Leo locally uh, by the uh, Kadnoff Rice Postdoctoral Fellowship Center Materials Research Center, but also there's a Kadnoff Center for Theoretical Physics within our own physics department. I'm glad to see that Ruth uh, is also here, so uh, we welcome you, Ruth, back to the department. So thank you. Leo believed that science progressed when people worked together, and his example inspired much collaborative work across disciplines. He would highlight problems that he found exciting and would bring people together. And these include mathematicians, computer scientists, theorists, and experimentalists to work on a solution. And this is something that we really hold dear and which is something which we think is fundamental to our department. The American Physical Society, after Leo's death, uh, wanted to honor Leo with the Leo P. Kadanoff Prize. It honors Leo's legacy, legacy, both in his role as a scientist and also his role as the president of the APS from 2007 to 2008. He was the spokesperson for all of physics and this uh, role which he fulfilled exceedingly well. The prize recognizes a scientist whose work, theoretical, experimental, or computational, has opened up new vistas for statistical and or nonlinear physics. So today, I'm really very pleased to have Roger Goldenfeld here as the 2020 Leo P. Kadnoff Prize recipient. The, um, let's see, this thing's in my way, so I can't see. Well, the, uh, so you'll have to fill out the rest that's hidden by my screen, uh, Nigel. But uh, the citation reads, for profound contributions to the fields of dynamical pattern formation, superconductivity, and fluid turbulence, together with creative developments and the exposition of the theory of the renormalization group. Nigel is at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, which uh, was also Leo's home from 1962 to 1969. Nigel has been a frequent visitor here, and I'm sure after his talk today, you will see why he has been invited back so often. He received his BA and PhD from the University of Cambridge, and he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Theoretical Physics at Santa Barbara, where I first got to uh, know him, and I first met him there. Since 1985, he has been on the faculty at the University of Illinois. Nigel's research explores how patterns evolve Examples include the growth of snowflakes, the microstructures of materials, the flow of turbulent fluids, the dynamics of geological formations, the spatial structure of ecosystems, and, and what he's been telling us in the last half hour has been about the models of the ten, ben, te, pandemic spread here in Illinois and in, on his own campus. 
Nigel's interest in emergent and collective phenomena extend from condensed matter physics to biology, where he has focused on the structure of evolution, microbial ecology, collective phenomena in social insects, and astrobiology. He is the author of one of the standard graduate textbooks in statistical mechanics, and he founded Numerix, a company that specializes in high-performance software for pricing and managing the risk of derivative securities. Nigel has been an Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Fellow, a university scholar at the University of Illinois, a recipient of the Xerox Award for Research, the Aid Nordseek Award for Excellence in Graduate Teaching. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he's a member of the US National Academy of Sciences. And of course, he is the recipient of the 2020 Leo P. Kadanoff Prize. So please join me in welcoming Nigel to our colloquium. Well, thank, thank you very much, Sid, for that uh, wonderful uh, introduction, and, uh, and particularly for uh, recalling for us um, Leo Kadanoff, uh, which of course is why we're all here today. Um, I can't tell you how thrilled uh, I was to, uh, to be honored with this award, uh, because um, no, there's no one more than Leo who inspired uh, and taught me during my my career, and I was very close to him scientifically, and also um, as, as, a, as a personal as a personal friend. Um, Leo's influence on the field, as you said, was was profound, and, and on me in in, in particular. Um, uh, he, in fact, at one point offered me a postdoc, which unfortunately I I never took. Um, but when I came to Illinois, I used to visit uh, Leo and uh, Albert and and others um, at Chicago frequently, and it was just an incredibly uh, exciting time. Um, you mentioned in your um, in your biography of me the uh, the company that I started when I took a year of entrepreneurial absence uh, from the University of Illinois. And um, and the first thing uh, I wanted to do when we started that company was have a scientific advisory board. And uh, and Leo was the uh, the person who we all wanted to have on it. And so he uh, he helped us immeasurably uh, during that time, um, not just in, in the financial or mathematics area, but also in branching our uh, science from our company out into other areas of medical physics um, that we were, were very uh, interested in. Uh, Leo, of course, was, was, a, was, a, was a great supporter and a, and, and a friend. And, um, you know, I just had such a wonderful time talking with him. He, as you all know better than I, um, there was no one quite uh, like Leo. Um, I, when you asked me to give this talk, I thought about, should I give the talk that I will be giving at the APS March meeting next year, um, when the uh, when the APS meeting has its virtual session, uh, a virtual prize session, and I decided not to do that. Um, and I'll say at that time a little bit more about my interactions with, with Leo over the years. The last, <clears throat> it makes me a bit uh, sad to think about this, the last conversation I had with Leo was at an APS meeting and I was telling him about the work that I'm going to show you today and he was uh, super excited. He asked um, lots of great questions um, and it was a it was a big encouragement, particularly at a time when the work that we were doing was, you know, very out of left field for most people who are, who are interested in fluid mechanics and in turbulence. But Leo, of course, understood everything that we were trying to do. And within you know, a few minutes, he understood it better than all of us uh, than, I was, than I did and so on. It was really something he was very supportive of. And so that's why I chose to give this talk. So, so let me start with, it, with the talk. And again, I'll, um, after the talk, I'll stick around as long as I can to answer any, any questions. Um, but again, let me, before I forget, let me just say th thank you for um, honoring me uh, by giving me this opportunity to give the nth uh, colloquium that I've given at the University of Chicago, but under this special uh, aegis. So what I want to talk about is, uh, is what I'm whimsically calling the life and death of turbulence. And uh, my, my, uh, my collaborators are listed uh, here, here at the bottom and, uh, and, and support. 
and um, I will explain, you'll see in, in this talk perhaps, uh, a little bit more about what this, uh, this graphic uh, represents. So let me start with some propaganda. And the, uh, the propaganda is really, um, you know, of course, in every physics talk, it's very important to say something uh, from Richard Feynman. So we should get it over and done with at the, at the beginning. And, um, and, and so what I want to start off is with the Feynman lectures on physics, which of course were another inspiration to many of us. Now, uh, in volume two of the Feynman lectures, uh, he derives the Navier-Stokes equations. And then this is what Feynman has to say. He says, we have written the equations of water flow from experiment, we find a set of concepts and approximations to use to discuss the solution, vortex streets, turbulent wakes, boundary layers. When we have similar equations in the less familiar situation, and one for which we cannot yet experiment, we try to solve the equations in a primitive, halting and confused way to try to determine what new qualitative features may come out or what new qualitative forms are a consequence of the equations. And you'll notice that I've highlighted uh, the word qualitative. It appears twice in, in this sentence. And I've highlighted it because, as, you, as, as you'll surely know, uh, Feynman got the Nobel Prize for his work on quantum electrodynamics, which is the most accurate scientific theory that we have ever developed. And so Feynman was just a master of the quantitative side of physics. But the thing that he chose to emphasize here was not that, but the qualitative features. And again, uh, he goes on and says, the next great era of awakening of human intellect may well produce a method of understanding the qualitative content of equations. Today we cannot, today we cannot see that the water flow of equations contain such things as the barber pole structure of turbulence that one sees between rotating cylinders. And then he mutters on about uh, Schrodinger and Frogs, Mozart and morality, we'll leave him there. But the point I want to make is that the qualitative behavior of matter is the domain of a statistical mechanics. And the way that we want to approach the problem of turbulence is to understand the qualitative content of the equations of fluid mechanics by understanding what we in physics, in condensed matter physics, would call the phase diagram and understand the universality and scaling laws of turbulence. And this is something that, of course, resonates greatly with uh, today's occasion because Leo was the person who really, in my view, uh, initiated the era of a uh, normalization group and gave us the tools by which we could truthfully understand the qualitative content of, of, of equations. And, I, and I'll be using uh, that specifically uh, in, in, in my talk. So what I'm going to show you is, uh, is some work that we've done with, with others in the community over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And, and I would say that this has really changed uh, turbulence from a field that could be described as a graveyard and often was to one which is really now uh, very dynamic and, uh, and alive. And I'm going to talk about two particular things that we've done. I'll focus mostly on transitional flows, how fluids become turbulent, but at the end I'll say something about fluctuation dissipation relations. So let's start off with uh, particles bouncing around in a box because that's what statistical mechanics is all about. So we start off with deterministic classical mechanics of many particles in a box, obeying Newton's equations of motion. You can put them on a computer and what you very quickly discover is that they obey uh, the, the, the laws of statistical mechanics, this deterministic uh, system of equations for these particles. So then you say, okay, well, fine, let's have an infinite number of particles. So now I have a field and the equations of motion for those particles uh, for this field then becomes the uh, Navier-Stokes equations where U is the coarse grained velocity. This is the incompressibility. And we also have included the friction uh, term in here as well. So this is now deterministic classical mechanics of an infinite number of particles in a box. And we shouldn't really be surprised that these equations which are deterministic also exhibit stochastics to solutions and obey statistical mechanics. And actually how that happens is really quite wonderful. It's not something I'm going to talk about today. It's really a topic though that I'm very excited about and we are working on, which is the phenomenon of what is known as spontaneous stochasticity. And if people want to ask me about that afterwards, I'll be happy to say something about it. 
So what do we mean when we talk about turbulence? So let me just show you uh, three examples here. Uh, we're talking here about a one-dimensional axis, which is our control parameter, the phase diagram, if you will. And this number is, is called the Reynolds number. It's a characteristic flow velocity, the characteristic dimensions of the, of the problem, and the kinematic viscosity, which is just the regular viscosity that comes in here, divided by the density. So as you look at uh, this diagram, here's what you can see. At low Reynolds numbers, the flow is laminar, which means it's steady and predictable. On the other hand, if you go to very high Reynolds numbers, say above 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth, and you send the fluid through a grid, uh, which is over here, then the flow that comes out is fluctuating, stochastic, and unpredictable. And here in the middle is the laminar turbulent transition, shown as this uh, transition behind this wind farm, where you have regions of laminar and regions of, uh, of apparently turbulent behavior. And this crossover happens at a Reynolds number, which in pipes is about 2000. There's nothing universal about this number. And we're going to see that this is really uh, a, a phase transition and we'll understand it in those terms. When I talk about the life and death of turbulence, what I'm really talking about is this, we're going to talk about how turbulence dies. So as you go down in Reynolds number, you go from turbulence to a laminar flow. And that transition, uh, we will I will tell you how it works. And that will call that the death of turbulence. And what happens up here, where you have a, a turbulent flow uh, growing and becoming more and more energetic, we'll call that the life of turbulence. And that's the why we have the title that we do. Now, one of the things that I want to point out is that even though I'm a theorist, um, I, like Leo's example, uh, I try to stay very closely wedded to experiment. And the theorist's typical picture of turbulence is you do homogeneous uh, isotropic turbulence in three dimensions with periodic boundary conditions. Now, I don't think that's really the right way to think about turbulence. Because as you can see in these flows, what's really happening is that I have a mean flow that is incident on the system, and then that generates turbulence behind it. So turbulence is really generated by instabilities. Um, and symmetry is the enemy of instability. And so that means that when you want to study turbulence, the worst thing you can do is choose a highly symmetric situation. One should choose a situation where you have some kind of mean flow and then try to understand how the instabilities work together to generate turbulence. The other thing that I want to point out is that because we're talking about a mean flow that is imposed on the system going from left to right in these examples here, turbulence actually also generates emergent mean flows that then interact with the mean flow that is applied. So what happens in turbulence are two phenomena which are closely related. Turbulence gener is generated by the mean flow, by instabilities, but also new mean flows arise as well. And one has to understand the interplay uh, between these things. So let's talk about, uh, 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 let's step back for a few minutes and ask, what does it mean to solve turbulence? People have been trying to solve it for many years. How would we know if we had solved it? So what does it really mean? So we're going to now talk for the next few minutes about different possible answers to this question. So let's suppose you go down the street, you try to find a, a physicist, and you ask her, what does it mean to solve turbulence? So what she might say is, well, if you could predict the fluctuations at small scales, that would be a, a solution to the problem of turbulence. Because we think of turbulence as being these velocity fluctuations, which gets, which are go on smaller and smaller scales, uh, smaller and smaller from the scale at which you excite the fluid. And so that's a natural thing to try to understand. And indeed, historically, physicists have used that as, as an answer. So let's think about what one would learn uh, by doing that. So let's suppose you put your fingers into the bathtub and you swirl them around. What you will do is you'll make some swirly, whirly eddy things. And those swirly, whirly eddies will, will split up into other smaller and smaller eddies. And eventually, you will uh, uh, get down to a length scale where the eddies are so small that, uh, that the dissipation uh, occurs. Now, this picture is called a cascade. And it was thought of by Richardson and Kolmogorov as a Hamiltonian process. In other words, when swirly whirly eddies break up into other smaller swirly whirly eddies, that's not due to friction. That actually is what eddies actually do. It's a Hamiltonian process. And so the idea then is that energy is fed in at this large length scale or small wave number. 
cascades down without loss of energy down to the smaller scales where molecular viscosity comes into play. That's a scale called the Kolmogorov scale. And after that, uh, viscous dissipation and dual heating occurs. But what happens in this, in this middle range is, uh, is not determined by viscosity. And so that has a very important consequence that Kolmogorov was the first to uh, identify. So let's go through what Kolmogorov contributed uh, to turbulence, one of the many things that he contributed. As always, we start off with dimensional analysis. So the quantity that we have here on the left-hand side is the kinetic energy per unit wave number range. And I'll write that down for you in, in, in one of the subsequent slides. So it's the, it, it's the turbulent energy per wave number range, or if you like, the Fourier transform of the velocity autocorrelation function. They're the, they're the same thing. This is going to depend on the wave number, k. It's going to depend on the energy input that you're putting into the system, how vigorously you're stirring your fingers around as you stir up the bathtub, the viscosity, and then the size of the system. Now, out of these variables, you can make a new length scale, which is called the Kolmogorov length, which turns out to be mu cubed over epsilon to the one quarter. And that, that's called the Kolmogorov scale. So now I can write my, uh, my equation as in, in terms of these dimensionless groups, nu squared over eta k, and then some dimensionless function of wave number times this length scale, and then wave number times the system size length scale. Now, to make any progress, we have to ask what happens when we take a, a, a very turbulent fluid. And what we want to look at is what happens at small scales. So that means we take k going to infinity. So we take the limit of KL going to infinity in this argument here, and we're going to assume what Russian mathematicians would call complete similarity, namely that I can replace this limit, KL going to infinity, by its limiting value, which is infinity. So we do that, and that's called complete similarity. The second thing that we can do is we can uh, take uh, this, this limit. So why do we want to take this limit? Well, we want to go to higher and higher Reynolds numbers, and that means we go to smaller and smaller viscosities. And so that means we take k eta going to zero. And so when we do that, we have to set this number here equal to zero. So now we have f of zero and infinity, and then this thing over here. Now, disaster looms when you do this because we're taking eta going to zero. So what has to happen is that eta at the front here and eta inside this function have to cancel out. And the only way that can happen is if this function is a scale invariant function of power law. So when you go ahead and do the calculation, you find it has to go as, as k to the 5 thirds. And this is the origin of the famous uh, uh, Kolmogorov scaling law, the k41 scaling law. So what we then have is as a picture of the energy spectrum, the kinetic energy per unit mass uh, uh, per wave number range going like this. It has this particular shape here in this intermediate range of length scales. This is the range where you're putting energy in. This is the range where energy is going out. And in this intermediate range, energy is cascading with a power and the spectrum has this functional form k to the minus five thirds. So that would be great, except it's not true. And the reason it's not true is that this limit here that we assumed had complete similarity, in other words, that there was complete scale separation between large scales and small scales, that turns out not to be the case. And it, in fact, the one way that this can break down is that we take this limit, and in this limit, this function goes like KL to the power eta, where eta is some anomalous uh, exponent, and, and, and there's many other ways this could happen, but this is the typical way that things uh, fail to have similarity in statistical mechanics, in critical phenomena, and, uh, and in, in turbulence, at least at this level of approximation. So this, uh, this then provides a correction to this k to the minus 5 thirds law, because now there is this extra factor of eta that goes in here. And this eta is known as the intermittency exponent. And it's measured, it's, it's very small. It's about 0.02, something like this. OK, so this is the uh, anomalous dimensions, if you will, of, of turbulence. So that's one way that you can think about turbulence as, as looking at small scales. Let's suppose that you walk down the street again and you run into an engineer. And the engineer says, 
well, what I really want you to do is predict for me the dissipation experienced at large scales, because I'm trying to design a car, or I'm trying to design an airplane, or a wind turbine, or a pump that's going to pump oil or gas through a large pipeline. So I want to know how big a pump I need, how much friction there's going to be, how much dissipation there's going to be that I have to overcome. So here's an example of that. So this is what happens when you pump a fluid that is turbulent through a pipe. And this is an experiment that was done in the 1930s and never surpassed by a Nicaragua. I'm going to return to this graph at the end of the talk. But what I want to, you to notice is this. Here I'm plotting the, the logarithm of the friction, a dimensionless measure of friction, the, really the pressure drop. Here I'm plotting the logarithm of the Reynolds number. And you can see that this curve is not a simple curve. It's non-monotonic. It has a particular anatomy. And this needs to be understood. And indeed, as I'll show you, can be understood at some level. Now, the other way you might think about turbulence is after Leo's influence, you might say, well, if I want to solve any problem, I need to know how to connect the scales. And so the question is, can I predict the friction that you observe at large scales from the nature of the turbulent state at smaller scales? Is there then a connection between the small scale velocity fluctuations and the large scale dissipative processes? And if you could find that, that would be an example of something that we would call a, a fluctuation dissipation relation. Now, another way you might answer this question is you might say, well, I, would, I can't really say that I've understood turbulence until I can tell you when and how a fluid actually becomes turbulent. So how do we understand the transition to turbulence? Now, this was something that was first investigated scientifically by Osborne Reynolds in the 1880s. And here is uh, him or his laboratory assistant uh, at his, at his uh, laboratory apparatus here. And fundamentally, what is happening is fluid is going into this, into this pipe. Um, you inject uh, some ink into the pipe, and you see whether the, what streak the ink makes in the fluid. And from that, you can try to infer something about the nature of the fluid state. In this sequence of pictures here, you're going from small speeds to higher speeds. And you can see that what happens at small speeds is that the flow is smooth and regular, and the ink just makes a single line streak like that, nothing very special. At high speeds, the ink uh, breaks down uh, after the initial entry into a complicated pattern, an irregular, turbulent, jagged, stochastic pattern. And in between, you get what Reynolds called flashes and what we today call puffs, where you have regions of lamina interrupted by turbulence, regions of lamina interrupted by turbulence, and so on and so forth. And this puzzling behavior is one of the reasons why turbulence has been so difficult uh, to understand, at least the transition to turbulence. So now that I've shown you this picture, you might ask, well, how much turbulence is there in the pipe? How much is, of the pipe is occupied by these turbulent flashes, and how much is occupied by the lamina? And you can measure this, and I'll show you where these data come from uh, later in the talk. But basically, what you find is that the turbulent fraction as a function of Reynolds number follows this curve uh, like this. And, and this transition is indeed not spatially uniform. You have these rare, sharp bursts of turbulence that need to be understood. So what is the quantitative description of the transition to turbulence? That's something we have to understand as well. Now, when you look at these pictures, you're probably thinking, aha, this is, this is Leo coming back uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, to guide us. Uh, these pictures look very much like what happens in a continuous phase transition. This graph here looks like the order parameter as a function of temperature at a second order phase transition. This graph here, this is the, the um, energy spectrum, which as I told you is the, is the power spectrum or the velocity order correlation function. And so power law correlated fluctuations and this sort of uh, behavior for the order parameter are indeed characteristics of phase transitions. And so you might think that there is a connection between them and you'd be right. So then why is it the case that fully developed turbulence is so hard? So I've just shown you that there is some kind of connection between phase transitions and turbulence. So let's answer this question by asking why are phase transitions so hard? 
So this was the problem, of course, that, that Leo essentially cracked, in my opinion. And what we have in the phase transition problem is you have strong interactions and, and very non-Gaussian fluctuations uh, in the order parameter. And the other thing you have is that there's no usable small parameter. Now, uh, you might think, well, that's that's really surprising because we obviously have a small parameter. I'm looking at a phase transition at temperature Tc. I'm at the temperature T. Obviously, the small parameter is T minus Tc over Tc. But if you look on page 194 of any good textbook on the normalization group, what you'll find is that the uh, if we write down the Landau free energy for the transition and then rescale it, what ends up happening is that the coefficient of the uh, of the order parameter uh, in self interactions scales as this reduced temperature to the power d minus four over two. And so what that means is that as you get closer and closer to the transition temperature, this coupling constant, at least below four dimensions, goes to infinity. It doesn't go to zero. So you have a small parameter, but it's not a usable one, at least not in the physical dimension. Similarly, when you look at turbulence, uh, you have strong interactions and fluctuations in the velocity derivatives. They're very non-Gaussian and you have intermittency, bursts of strong fluctuations. If you look at the Navier-Stokes equations, again, you can see that as the viscosity goes to zero, which means that the Reynolds number is going to infinity, you still have this coefficient of, unit of, of one in front of the only nonlinearity in the problem, this quadratic nonlinearity here. And so you can never get rid of that. And so again, you have no usable small parameter. Now, the critical phenomenon problem was, was, was solved by, uh, by uh, Ken, Ken Wilson, Leo Kadanoff, and Ben Widom, uh, Le Leo and Ben discovering data collapse and the idea of, of scaling, and Wilson uh, developing from that uh, underlying physical picture uh, the renormalization group. So now let's ask ourselves the question, can we solve turbulence, or at least make some progress in solving it, by following what we've learned from critical phenomena, and can we see if turbulence itself exhibits critical phenomena at its onset? And I'm going to show you that the answer to both these questions is definitely yes. So let's now talk uh, for, for quite a while about the transition uh, to turbulence. This is a physics problem that was, in, in fact, the, the subject of Werner Heisenberg's uh, PhD thesis. Um, and I, I don't need to justify this as physics to this audience, of course. Now, the way we study turbulence experimentally today is very different uh, in nature but not very different in, in, in principle from the way it was uh, studied in the time of Reynolds. And what I'm going to show you is, is, is work um, that was done uh, by a Björn Hoff, absolutely beautiful seminal work, particularly this paper in, in 2008. So what, what really was the breakthrough here was, the, was uh, understanding the answer to this question. If I take a pipe, I make it have a laminar flow through it, and then I perturb it in some way to make a little patch of turbulence. How long will that patch of turbulence last? Will it last until it gets to the end of the pipe? Or will it just die away very quickly? And of course, the answer to that question is going to depend on the Reynolds number. So here's the experiment. You take a pipe, you inject a disturbance here. Uh, the, the fluid with the, with the um, little patch of turbulence uh, flows through the pipe. And you can ask the following question. If the turbulence survived until it got to the end, the, the turbulence is going to increase the drag. And so it's going to slow down the, the fluid as it exits the pipe. And so it'll follow the red trajectory. If on the other hand, the turbulence very quickly dies away, then by the time it comes out the other end here, the, the fluid will be going a bit faster and will follow the yellow trajectory. And so you can ask the following question. Did the turbulence survive, yes or no? And, and you get an answer. And then you can do this experiment thousands and thousands of times and build up a survival probability, which is the probability as a function of Reynolds number and time that the turbulence survived. And of course, you know how fast the fluid is going through the pipe and you know how far it has to travel. And so you can construct this survival probability. So what do you see when you actually do that experiment? So here is a picture of uh, from a numerical simulation uh, showing you the turbulent intensity, showing you a puff in a, in a, in a real pipe. 
<clears throat> in, a, in a simulation. If you make such a puff, it turns out that if you're below about 2050 Reynolds number, the puff will eventually die away. And we can measure how it dies away. So this is the logarithm of the probability for the survival as a function of Reynolds number and time. This is linear time along the horizontal axis here. And these are data for different Reynolds numbers. And because we've taken the logarithm here, you can see that the survival probability is following an exponential memoryless process. And from this, you can extract a slope. And that slope tells you the lifetime as a function of Reynolds number. And when you plot that puff lifetime as a function of Reynolds number, you get the curve shown here. But this is the logarithm of the lifetime. And this curve is curving upwards. And so it says that the puff lifetime is growing faster than an exponential with the Reynolds number. Now you go to higher Reynolds number still above 2050. And now what happens is puffs can decay, but they can also split into two and make a, a, a daughter puff as, as shown here. And so uh, you can then ask the following question. If the, the puffs are going to split, how long does it take them to split? Well, obviously, the higher in Reynolds number you go, the more the system wants to become turbulent. So concomitantly, as you reduce the Reynolds number from a high number, the time it takes for them to split is going to get longer and longer. And so what you expect is a curve that is going to uh, get, be small at high Reynolds numbers and is going to increase as you go down in Reynolds number. And indeed, that is what you observe. And that mean time between splitting events, that logarithm is shown here. And so again, this is increasing faster than an exponential function. So then you say, let's do the last refuge of the scoundrel and let's take the double logarithm of this time scale. And when you take that double logarithm, what you find is that the curves now become beautifully straight. And you might say almost every curve will become straight when you take two logarithms, but there's a reason for these two logarithms. And this intersection point is the point where turbulence will eventually be in the pipe at some level. And, and that's the, how you define the critical Reynolds number. So what I've shown you so far is that all the time scales associated with the transition to turbulence scale as e to the e to the Reynolds number. And that's a very strange law, super exponential scaling. And later I will show you where that comes from. So how do we make a theory for the laminar turbulence transition? Well, to do that, let's go back and remind ourselves what we learned uh, from Leo and, and others. And let's talk about the system that we studied the best, and that indeed was the subject that, that Leo was a, indeed a great expert in, and that is magnet, magnets. So at the lowest level of description, you have the electronic structure of the material. That's obviously much too complicated. And so you start to look at an effective theory for the interaction of the magnetic moments. You get an Ising model. Well, the Ising model is a quantum mechanical model and is very complicated. So you say, poof, let's, go, let's get rid of the quantum mechanics. So you get rid of the quantum mechanics and make it a classical Ising model. Well, that model is also too complicated unless you're in two dimensions. There's no external magnetic field and your name is Lars Onzaga. Other than that, the Ising model is in, intractable. So then what you do is you, uh, you approximate the thermodynamics near the transition. You write down the Landau theory that I'd shown you a few minutes ago. And then from that, using Kadnov's uh, block uh, spin ideas and renormalization group, you can then work out all the critical exponents and, the, and the, everything to do with the transition. And that works extraordinarily well. So let's just go through what you get from that. So this is the order parameter as a function of temperature. This is the critical temperature. And near this critical temperature, the, the statistical mechanics is dominated by weak, long wavelength modes. They're weak. On the other hand, they contribute 100% to the non-analyticities of the problem. And the behavior of this magnetization as you go below the critical temperature is described by this critical exponent beta. If you had to ask somebody to guess what this curve would be, you'd say it's a, a, a parabola or quadratic a conic section. But in fact, it turns out to be not as analytic as that. And, and there's an exponent beta here. On the other hand, uh, let's suppose you ask a different question. Let's sit exactly at TC and asks, what happens when I apply an external magnetic field to the system? 
Now, normally what would happen is you'd say, if I have a magnet, I apply an external magnetic field, I'm going to induce a magnetization that is proportional to what I impose from the outside. But that simple linear response law that everybody is familiar with, that also breaks down at, at a critical point. And in fact, the scaling is, is again, some uh, singular scaling, which is usually represented in this way. And what Widom and, 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 uh, and, and Leo were able to explain uh, uh, was how the magnetization, a function of ostensibly two variables, the reduced temperature and external magnetic field, is really a function of this combined uh, variable here. And we can see how well this works. So this is the magnetization scaled in the way that renormalization group predicts. This is the temperature scaled in the way that renormalization group predicts. These are data from five different magnetic materials, and they all collapse onto a universal curve. And the solid line is the renormalization group uh, prediction. And so you can see that we have universality uh, at this critical point. And indeed, some of the very first um, um, experimental evidence for universality was collected and accumulated uh, by Leo Kadanoff and a class of students at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and presented in a seminal uh, Reviews of Modern Physics paper in 1967. So going back to uh, our picture here, this is what we know from magnets. So what about turbulence? Well, at the lowest level of description, uh, we have the kinetic theory of gases. That's far too complicated. So now we course grain up to the Navier-Stokes equations. That's also intractable and also not really necessary because all we need to understand turbulence, uh, at least the transitions, is the Landau theory and the renormalization group universality class. So now what I want to talk about is how one identifies the Landau theory and constructs it and then uh, determines the renormalization group universality class. So based on what we know about phase transitions, what we want to look for are long wavelength collective modes at the laminar turbulence transition. And of course, that's a very hard thing to calculate. We can't even calculate these things for condensed matter physics problems, let alone the Navier-Stokes equations. And so what we did was we looked at numerical uh, simulations. So let me show you uh, numerical simulations. If, let's try it again. All right, there we go. So here's what we uh, did, what we discovered. We discovered that there's basically two important modes near the transition to turbulence. One is a small scale mode, which is the turbulence itself. And the other is an induced mean flow, which we'll call a zonal flow, which goes around the, uh, the pipe in the azimuthal direction. And that mean flow does not depend upon the z direction. It's a long wavelength a k equals zero mode. It has a radial structure and a time dependence, which you can see here. And when you compute the energy in that mode and compare it with the energy in the turbulence mode, you can see that they are, have persistent, uh, somewhat noisy uh, oscillations and cycles, which are 90 degrees out of phase. And that's very suggestive of something else that I tend to work on, which is the predator-prey behavior in an ecosystem. So let me explain to you where that oscillation comes from. What's going on at the micro scale is what, what you could see in the picture that I showed you uh, before I started the talk. What happens is that in the core of the pipe, you have turbulent uh, fluctuations. And if you took a snapshot of it, you'd see that the turbulent fluctuations are anisotropic. In other words, a snapshot will show you more turbulence, say, in one direction than another. And then what will happen is th th that fluctuation in velocity will sort of squirt out some fluid, which will go, go outwards, hit the walls, and, uh, and start to circulate uh, like this. And what, what you can do from the, the Reynolds uh, equations, from the Navier-Stokes equations, is show that the velocity, the mean velocity in this azimuthal direction is driven by the radial gradient of the velocity fluctuations. And these symbols here are the velocity fluctuations in the radial and angular directions. So what's happening then is that the turbulence is driving this emergent mean flow. But what does this emergent mean flow do? Well, what it does, of course, it will shear the turbulence. And by shearing the turbulence, it will reduce the anisotropy. It'll make it more isotropic. 
So what you have is a picture is that turbulence induces this zonal flow. The zonal flow then shears and isotropizes the turbulent fluctuations. That then suppresses the turbulence. And then because the turbulence has been suppressed, the driving force for the zonal flow has been suppressed. But now that the zonal flow has been suppressed, then the turbulent fluctuations are no longer isotropized. And so uh, they can become more isotropic and isotropic again. And so the cycle begins again and again. And so that's why you have this cyclical behavior. And as I mentioned, this is very much like what happens in an ecosystem where you have a prey and a predator. So let's talk about an e ecosystem. So here is, a, uh, here is a wolf, here is a sheep or some other creature. I mean, you know, we're all theoretical biologists, so they're all spherical cows to us. So anyway, so this is some predator, this is some prey, and what is happening is that the, uh, the, the predator uh, starts to eat the prey, the prey start to uh, lose their population, and as they lose their population, the predators no longer have as much food to eat as they had before, so their population goes down. But now there's fewer predators, wolves or whatever they were, and so then the sheep population can then start to rise again. And so you get this, this cyclical uh, behavior between the predator and the prey, uh, as shown in this time series here. So what, we, what we've discovered then is that there is putatively a connection between what is happening between these modes in a, in, in a turbulent pipe and these modes that happen in an ecosystem. And so now I want to show you what happens if you take this seriously and you now try to construct a Landau theory based on this putative uh, analogy. So let's discuss how would we describe as statistical mechanicians the dynamics of a predator-prey ecosystem. Now, what you would do is you'd say, well, I'm a statistical mechanician, so everything is particles bouncing around in a box. The red ones are the predators, the black ones are the prey, and the empty space represents the food that is available for them, say grass or whatever it might be. And the way we study this system is we study it at the individual level. So we ask what happens uh, when a predator encounters a prey, what happens uh, to the system? So let's look at this particular reaction here. This says a predator A runs into a prey B, and with probability P eats the prey, and then has enough energy to reproduce and make a baby predator. So now you end up with twice as many as you had before. And these are the processes. This one tells you how prey uh, compete for food. This one tells you how prey eat food and uh, have enough energy to make baby prey and so on and so forth. And everything can die, of course. And when you take these stochastic equations and solve them numerically or analytically, you find that indeed you get these persistent stochastic solutions. So let's now then try to construct a Landau theory for the transitional pipe turbulence. And so what we're going to do is we're going to write down the Feynman diagrams that describe the interactions between this emergent mean flow and the turbulent fluctuations. And the Navier-Stokes equations have this quadratic nonlinearity. So what that means is that all of these vertices are going to uh, be, be triplets and these diagrams here that you can just write down by writing down all possible diagrams actually have their counterparts in terms of predator-prey dynamics. So let's look at this one, for example. This one shows you turbulence interacting with a zonal flow, and then something happens, and then out at the end comes two zonal flow lines, two predator lines. Over here is the, is the this is, if this is the wave picture, this is the particle picture, this says the predator, in this case, the zonal flow, runs into the prey, in this case, the turbulence, and then with some probability, uh, kills the turbulence and produces two zonal flow lines. Every diagram that you can write down here has a counterpart in terms of the predator-prey uh, dynamics. This idea of writing down the Navier-Stokes equations in field theory was first done by my colleague and Leo's, Leo Kadanoff's colleague, when he was at Illinois, uh, Bill Wilde. So now what I want to show you is this. Let's write down this Landau theory and then ask the following question. Does a Landau theory, which is based on a stochastic predator-prey dynamics, can it recapitulate turbulence data? And by that I mean, can I get the phase diagram, the lifetime statistics, and even predict the universality loss? And I want to emphasize that everything I'm going to show you now 
has never been touched by the Navier-Stokes equations. We're now simply writing down the, the, the Landau theory and looking at the predictions of this Landau theory, which we got suggested to us from the numerical simulations. So here's the phase diagram that I've shown you before of pipe turbulence. What about the phase diagram for a spatially extended predator-prey system? So the first question is, what is the analog of this control parameter, the Reynolds number? And I've chosen the control parameter to be the prey birth weight. So let's think about why that would be the case. Suppose I have a predator, let's say a wolf, and a prey, let's say a sheep, or a rabbit, let's say a rabbit, and now I asked the following question. Suppose the reproduction time of a rabbit turned out to be uh, 100 years, which of course it isn't. So then what would happen is the predators would eat up all the rabbits, they wouldn't be able to reproduce because uh, it takes 100 years, and so everything would just die. On the other hand, let's suppose that the reproduction rate of the rabbits is much faster than 100 years, let's say you know, a few days or a microsecond or something like this. Then what would happen is that the predators would eat the rabbits, but the rabbits are meanwhile producing baby rabbits. And so you can get into a situation where there is a coexistence of the predator and the prey. And so that tells you then that as I vary the prey birth rate, I go from a regime where the ecosystem has died, where there's only nutrient, to an ecosystem where the predator and prey coexist. Now, when you simulate this predator-prey ecosystem in a spatially resolved way, what you find is if I start off with a patch of predator and prey, it self-organizes into this kind of structure here, which uh, moves in this direction. These are the prey being followed by the predator. And if I increase the birth rate up to here, I get traveling waves, I get splitting, I get these things split, just as the puffs split over here. So this model system recapitulates the phase diagram that you see in pipe flow turbulence. Here is a picture of the puff splitting in the predator-prey system. Oh no, this is the right-hand side is turbulent. So here you have a turbulent puff. This is space, this is time, and the color scale is turbulent intensity. So here is a puff that is slightly going backwards in space, and then at this time it splits into two puffs, one here and one here, and then there's subsequent splitting events. If I take my population uh, event here, um, what happens here again is the population uh, is, is uh, you know, I have a one, uh, one puff, if you will, of, uh, and I'm showing you the prey intensity, the turbulent intensity, and then here it splits into two, and then subsequent bifurcations, as you can see over here. So we see puff splitting in this predator-prey ecosystem. So now that I've shown you that you can get a decaying population and a splitting population, let's measure the statistics of the extinction time and the time between population splitting events. And so this is what you get when you do it. So this one here is the turbulence, no, nope, this one here. This one here is the turbulence data, uh, which, uh, which I've shown you before, showing you the super exponential rise in decay lifetime and the sub super exponential decay in lifetime uh, during the splitting phase. Over here is the, is, the, is the prey lifetime and the time between population splitting events for this predator-prey ecosystem. And you can see that they recapitulate for each other uh, precisely. So what we've learned then is that the death of turbulence going down in Reynolds number is like the extinction transition of a predator-prey ecosystem. So what I've shown you so far is we start off with turbulence. We look for, the, for what are the important modes near the transition using numerics. We find a kind of two fluid model. We see that it has the characteristics of a predator-prey system. And so we construct our Landau theory. But what we really care about is what the universality class is. So now I want to show you that this universality class is actually directed percolation. And I'm going to show you that uh, we know this is true because we can take our stochastic field theory for predator-prey, do some field theory and various things like that, show it's in the same universality class as Regian field theory from high energy physics, and then show that that is, well, is the same universality class as directed percolation. Now I'm going to show you how we get to this side of the loop uh, using a kind of graphical shortcut rather than showing you anything to do with, with path intervals. So let's talk about what directed percolation actually is. So I like to start off my day, as I'm sure many of you do, with a nice cup of coffee. So how do you make a cup of coffee? 
So this is what you do is you uh, get a clinical filter, you grind some coffee, you pour the coffee grinds in, and then you pour the water in and the water trickles through and you make a nice cup of coffee. Well, I like my coffee to be nice and strong. So what happens is if I just did it as, as I described to you, uh, what happens is that the water very quickly goes through the coffee granules and the cup of coffee you get at the other, at the other end is weak, nasty petrol station coffee just undrinkable. So that's no good. So then you say, well, fine, let's just push the grains tighter together. And in, in that way, the coffee, the water as it goes through the coffee granules is going to take longer and so will absorb more of the good stuff. So you can think of that as a sort of computer game where I have a probability P of, of the water trickling through from one site to the next. If there isn't a bond there, if it can't get through, it just gets jammed. So what happens is when you make your cup of coffee and you put the coffee granules in and you pat them down. Now you pour the water in. What happens, of course, is the water can't find its way through the coffee granules. And so it backs up and goes all over the counter. And if your kids yell at you, your wife yells at you, the dog barks, and your morning has started off really, really badly. So if you're really good at this, you can make the perfect cup of coffee just by having the coffee granules uh, correctly positioned so that the water percolates through not too fast and not too slow. It just manages to get to the other side. Now, if you look at the trajectories that the water can possibly take here, you can easily convince yourself that every possible graph that you can make of this process can be broken down into four basic processes, one of which I'll call annihilation. You start off at this time over here, and then at the next time step, um, it, this fill site becomes empty. Or a process called decoagulation, where you start off at this fill site and it goes into this site over here and this site over here. Or just diffusion, the water just hops around in some diagonal way. And lastly, coagulation, where these two occupied sites go into one site over here, and that's called coagulation. These four basic processes are the foundation of every possible uh, contact process that you can build in directed percolation. So what I've shown you by, by this uh, thought experiment is what uh, is what is shown here. As I vary the percolation probability, that tells you how easy it is to for the water to get through the coffee granules. If it's very easy to get through, so the percolation probability is high, then basically it easily gets through to the other side at very long times. And so many of these sites are occupied. And what you've got is petrol station coffee. That's no good. On the other hand, if the probability to be able to percolate through is too small, then you'll just get stopped halfway through. And this is the scenario where it backs up over the counter and everybody yells at you. And the perfect cup of coffee is when you're at the exact critical point where the fluid can just about percolate through. And at long times, only one of these sites is, is occupied. This behavior is also a phase transition and can be a non-equilibrium one and can be characterized by universal exponents such as the turbulent fraction rho, which is just the density of occupied sites at long times. And that goes as P minus PC to the power beta. And this is the, the uh, critical exponent, one of the critical exponents that characterizes direct percolation. Now, when we're talking about the decay of turbulence, what we're doing is actually directed percolation in three space and one time direction. So what I'm showing you in this left panel here is a green site represents a part of fluid that is turbulent. The transparent sites represent ones which are, which are laminar. And what you're looking at is a puff evaporating in three plus one dimensions, taking a certain length of time to do it. If I were to look at this edge on in, in one dimension, what you would see is I start off with a bunch of filled sites which are turbulent. And as I go longer and longer in time, I get these trails here. And the longest trail here is the last remaining pixel that you can see in this, in this simulation. And so the time that the turbulence takes to decay is determined by the longest percolation path. So because it's the longest percolation path, what that means is that the statistics of turbulent decay are governed by what are known as extreme value statistics. Now, let's think about this. Random variables, if you have a bunch of random variables and you say, what is the statistics that governs the average of a bunch of random variables, you know the answer to that. You learned it on your mother's knee. 
it's just the central limit theorem. The probability distribution is a Gaussian. But if you take a bunch of random variables and you ask for the maximum among those random variables, the statistics that govern that were worked out by Fisher and Tippett in the 1920s. And there's three fixed points for that distribution. And the one that concerns us is this distribution here, which is the cumulative distribution. And that goes as e to the minus e to the minus y. In other words, the cumulative statistics for the extreme value problems, the longest path, is indeed a super exponential function. And this is the fundamental reason why you get the super exponential scaling that I showed you before. Now, when we go back to our predator prey ecosystem, this is what the equations I've shown you before, but now I've added space. And space is these, these, uh, these um, i and, and j, they represent sites uh, on a lattice. These are all the processes I showed you before, um, spatially extended. Now, near the extinction transition of this ecosystem, the prey population is very small and no predator can survive. So basically, A is even smaller and so it is essentially zero. So let's cross out these reactions that correspond to pre predators uh, in the system. So poof, they're gone. And now what I've got, I've gone from my three trophic level ecosystem, predator, prey, and food, to a two trophic level ecosystem of prey and food. And these equations here, if I write them down diagrammatically, they look exactly like these equations. Look at the i and j representing the site labels. So the equations that you have left with are the four basic processes of directed percolation. And so what I've just shown you is that near the extinction transition, the stochastic predator-prey dynamics reduces to directed percolation. And therefore, the laminar turbulence transition is in the directed percolation universe antiphase. Very surprising. But let's see, is it true? So here's another beautiful experiment that was done by uh, Björn Hoff's group uh, um, in, in reported in the same issue of Nature Physics as our, as our own work. So this is the uh, outer cylinder uh, and this is an inner cylinder of two concentric cylinders, the Kuwait flow. And what's special about this system is the gap between them is very small and the, the uh, perimeter is very long compared to the gap uh, between them. So you ask the following question, rotate the outer cylinder. And then you ask, what do you see if I just look along this line here? As the fluid goes past, boom, 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 it goes past, what do you see? The first, as it rotates the first time past, you see nothing and then you see this black line here and this black line represents a turbulence. Why? Because the fluid has got little um, calyroscope in it and when it is, um, when it is um, aligned, it scatters light back to you and so it looks bright. And when it is turbulent, it's random and so it looks dark, so the light is absorbed. So this is a patch of turbulence. Then, then the fluid rotates around the second time. So you see the same pattern. And the third time you see the same pattern. But they're not exactly the same pattern. If you take these pictures and stack them up one underneath each other, you get the picture shown over here. The blue is the turbulence, the yellow is the lamina. And what you see over here is the petrol station cup of coffee, the coffee going over the counter, and this is the perfect cup of coffee. In other words, you see that these trajectories look just like the pictures of directed percolation. If you then go and do a measurement of this, so you measure the turbulent fraction over here at long times uh, as a function of Reynolds number and do this carefully, what you get over about two decades of scaling is you find that it's scaling with an exponent beta, which is exactly the exponent predicted for one plus one directed percolation. You can do a numerical simulation of this. Uh, this is a two plus one dimensional uh, uh, planar shear flow that was uh, done by this group over here. And without going into detail, uh, he, they, uh, they also were able to measure uh, the critical exponents and even some of the universal scaling functions of directed percolation. How about the predator-prey dynamics? That's very hard to observe in, in a simple pipe, but you can observe it in magnetohydrodynamics. So this is a, 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 um, a tokamak where one tries to uh, achieve plasma fusion. You have drift turbulence that goes around the, uh, the axis like this, and you have a zonal flow around the outside that confines, uh, the, that confines the turbulence. 
And this group uh, et al, Estrada et al, in about 10 years or so ago, were able to measure uh, through ingenious uh, ways the predator prey oscillations in this situation that had in fact been predicted um, 20 years earlier uh, by a pad time company. So what I've shown you is that the, the laminar turbulence transition is a non-equilibrium critical point in the universality class of directed percolation. So I want to end by just telling you a little bit about what we know about fluctuations and, and dissipation, and then, and then I'll quit. I won't take, uh, I'm going to go through this uh, rather uh, superficially. So what you do in 1933, if you're Nicaragua and you've got nothing else to do, is you take a pipe and then you get a bunch of sand grains and you glue them to the sides of the pipe very painstakingly, and you make sure the sand grains have the same size. Then what you do is you send fluid through pipes of different radius, but with the same sand grains in them, and you measure the pressure drop per unit length normalized by the turbulence, by, the, by, the, uh, by rho u squared, the kinetic energy per unit mass. When you do that, you get the curve that I showed you before. What's happening here is this is the dimensionless friction factor in logarithm against the logarithm of the Reynolds number. The smoother the pipe is, the lower is the friction. So these pipes over here are smooth. This one up here is most, is most rough. And this is the roughness ratio between the roughness of the sand grains and the pipe diameter. Now, over here, this is the turbulent region. And what you can see is that there's two scaling regimes. One regime is where as you go to smoother and smoother pipes, the friction factor goes more and more closely to this straight line shown over here, which scales as Reynolds to the minus a quarter. As you go to larger and larger Reynolds numbers, the friction factor becomes independent of Reynolds number and then just depends on the roughness. And it depends on the roughness to the one third power. If you now ask, is this a critical phenomenon? How would you ask that question? Well, I already showed you that critical phenomena have two things. They have power law correlations and they have the data collapse. And this was the data collapse that I showed you uh, at the beginning of the talk. Now turbulence, as I showed you already, has this Kolmogorov spectrum, e to e of k is k to the minus five thirds. So if I really want to know it, has a, it is a critical phenomenon, I should ask, what is the analog of the data collapse for turbulence? And we found it. And the answer is this result over here. So this is the formula that you get. I'm not going to go through how you get this and, and, and where it comes from. Basically just following Leo's block spin constructions, those sorts of ideas, and that's how you can motivate this. And here are the Nicaragua data plotted in the way that the theory predicts. And you can read off from this data collapse, what is the value of this exponent eta, this anomalous exponent that describes the anomalous dimensions of turbulence. And you find that it is about 0.02, consistent with spectral estimates. So what that says then is that at large Reynolds numbers, turbulence is also controlled by some kind of non-equilibrium critical point, very different from the one that controls the transition to turbulence. And the phenomena in here are some kind of crossover phenomena. Now, what's beautiful about this, now that we've completed this this, uh, this, this diagram here, now that we know what goes in here, is we can make the following claim. We can say, simply by measuring the pressure drop across a pipe, Nicaragua in 1933 measured the anomalous spectral exponents of turbulence eight years before Komogorov even came up with the mean field theory. It's absolutely fantastic. And moreover, this is a fluctuation dissipation relation because the friction factor is related now to the intermittency corrections to the velocity fluctuations. So we see that there's some kind of connection between fluctuations and dissipation. Now, I'm not going to go through how you work out the critical exponents. You can derive that one quarter and one third power law by heuristic arguments, uh, first done by uh, uh, my colleagues, um, uh, uh, Gustavo Joy and Panaki Chakraborty. And this tells you precisely how to relate the friction factor to, to some uh, integral of the energy spectrum, in other words, the fluctuations. Now, we tested this theory uh, experimentally, and we did it by going into two dimensions. Now, to cut a long story short, in three dimensions, you have this one cascade that Kolmogorov uh, uh, predicted. But in two dimensions, 
it turns out that there were two cascades, a cascade of energy, which actually goes to, uh, uh, to large wavelengths in two dimensions, and a cascade of vorticity, known as entropy cascade, that goes to small dimensions. And that cascade, if you look at the energy associated to it, the energy spectrum goes as a different power law, k to the minus three. And because it has a different exponent here, that means that the friction factor will have a different scaling with Reynolds number. Because in this statistical mechanical theory of, of turbulence, there, there is a connection between the friction and the energy spectrum, the velocity fluctuations. So you can do that calculation, and this is what you predict. So we tested it experimentally uh, by taking a, a University of Illinois a graduate student and sending him to work for two years in Walter Goldberg's lab uh, in, in Pittsburgh. And the experiment that we did uh, was um, a soap film experiment. So we have a soap film shown schematically here and in real life over here. We, we can put roughness against the walls uh, using this kind of saw blade structures, just the two dimensional analog of what Nikaradze did. We, you, we fire laser beams at the, at the, at the flow and the uh, and particles in the flow and scatter the laser beams. And so we can measure the velocity uh, um, profile uh, in the flow and, and many other things besides. So when you do that, what you find is that in this geometry, where you have a grid up here, the swirly whirly things have an energy spectrum that goes as k to the minus three, this entropy cascade that, that was uh, expected. If on the other hand, you do the geometry shown over here, what you find is that you get an energy spectrum which scales as k to the minus 5 thirds, uh, as you would expect for the inverse energy cascade. And now in these two different geometries, one measures the friction factor. And what you find is that in the geometry, which is the energy cascade, the friction factor scales with Reynolds number with a one quarter power. And in the entropy cascade, it scales with a one half power, exactly as predicted. So what I've shown you then is that there is a connection between fluctuations and dissipation shown in two ways. One is the data collapse of Nicaragua's 1933 data. One is the, the fact that the friction factor depends on the energy spectrum. And this is something, this phenomenon here, this connection is not something that was previously known or anticipated in turbulence. And I know this because I went to the uh, APS DFD meeting one year, I sat down with a good friend of mine and a wonderful scientist and expert on, on turbulence, uh, uh, Professor Srinivasan, Kalpali Srinivasan, and asked him, what would you predict for this? And after he understood the question, he said, well, I don't know. I don't even know how to, why there should be a difference. But, uh, but, but indeed, there is a difference, and it's predicted by the statistical mechanics approach, and indeed, it is something that is seen experimentally. So let me, uh, let me wrap up. What I've shown you is that there are two critical points that characterize our understanding of turbulence. One is a, a special critical point at the laminar turbulence transition, and another one is a, a critical point at, at, at infinite Reynolds numbers, um, and where unifying concepts of fluctuation dissipation, I haven't had time to talk about rare events and mean flow interactions, but all of those come into what's happening over here. Okay, so these are the people who, who did the work. Uh, um, this is the late uh, Walter uh, Goldberg. Uh, this is uh, Hong Yen Shi, my graduate student and myself, standing in front of Reynolds's original apparatus, which you can see on display in the basement of the mechanical engineering department at the University of Manchester. And this is Tong Lin Si, who, who at the time was an undergraduate with us and is now a, a postdoc in atmospheric physics at Princeton. I want to end with this fortune cookie. Now, I am the best person on the entire planet to get this fortune cookie, and I actually got it. And what it says is this, turbulence is a life force. It is opportunity. Let's love turbulence and use it for change. And it also gives us, by way, some lucky numbers that you can use for your Monte Carlo simulation. Now, why do I want to show you this fortune cookie apart from just my natural sense of whimsy? Well, think about this. Usually what happens is if you have somebody who has any scent of a biophysicist about them. When they give a colloquium, they say, look at this, I've built this new super resolution microscope or this new supercomputer, and using the tools of physics, I can understand protein folding, or I can understand the organelles inside a cell or something like this. 
we use physics to try to understand better biology. But in this talk, the arrows went in the other direction. We were able to make this progress that I showed you in turbulence because we understood something about biology. In fact, the student who worked with me on this, Hong Yen Shi, like all my students, she has one project which is a physics project and another project which is a, a biology project if, if she wanted to do that. And so she was working on both of these things. And at some point during her PhD, we had the startling realization that both of these problems that she was working on, the stochastic uh, population biology problems and the uh, turbulence problems were actually the same one. It was really wonderful that uh, here, our understanding of biology translated into us being able to understand something uh, about physics. So with that, I'll leave you. Uh, here are some, some references to some of the work that I've talked about, and I'll be happy to take any questions. So thank you. Uh, so uh, there's a roar from the crowd. Nigel, you can probably hear it. Uh, so we're- Yeah, my windows are shaking. Um, yeah, very good. Uh, That's a turbulence. <laughs> Um, so I'm not quite sure how we handle questions here, but maybe if you just uh, uh, speak up and we, we hope we'll uh, be able to figure it out. So are there any questions? And the first question should come from a student. Great. I think there are a couple of questions in the chat box. Oh, okay. Do you want to, do you want to read it to me, Yunki? Uh, Anuj said, wouldn't ERA have to decrease rapidly enough to cancel growth in K, so that K eta goes to zero? I, I think the question is about um, when I showed how you derive the uh, Kolmogorov's K, uh, K to the minus by thirds law. So mm -hmm. that, 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 that's, that's right. The, the, so, so you know how, so what you're, what you're doing is essentially canceling the new dependence from inside and outside. So the only way it can cancel is if the function is a, is a power law function, and then you can quickly easily work out what that function have, have, has to be, and that's, the, uh, and that's how you get the, uh, the dependence on k. So you're not making k equal to zero. You're, you're, you're taking the asymptotic limit as k uh, uh, as, uh, as, as, as eta is, is going to zero. So, uh, so uh, um, you know, if you, well, I, I think it's, some, it's a piece of algebra that, you, that that's quite e easy to work out. So the first, the first statement I showed you is what's known as Komogorov's first similarity hypothesis, and the second statement is Komogorov's second similarity hypothesis. One comes from purely dimensional analysis. One is a statement about asymptotics that can only be understood by understanding the problem in detail. Okay, what's the next question? Is there an explanation for why the puffs split? Yeah. Um, yes, there, there is an explanation. So. Uh, so what, 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 well, what, what it, 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 it may be more complicated than, 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 than you want. The first question you want to ask is why do, why do the puffs even exist in the first place? And the answer is that near the boundary layer, energy is being pumped into the system through a kind of instability at the, at the wall, which is something, which is probably something close to what's called a Kelvin Helmholtz instability, which is the instability you can sometimes see in the sky when you see clouds uh, rolling along. It's an instability from uh, layers of fluid moving at different speeds. So that pumps energy into the puff. And so the, what happens is the puff then spreads in space. But once it spreads in space, the velocity uh, profile across the pipe uh, changes. So if I have a laminar flow, the velocity profile is a parabola. If I have a turbulent flow, the velocity pr profile across the pipe is basically a flat line. It's, it's basically very blunt. And so what happens is as the puff spreads, the velocity profile between the, as the puff spreads, splits up and it sucks energy, um, it, it sucks shear energy that is what's driving the puff. And so basically it's those interplay between the shear, uh, between the, the velocity um, at the wall and the velocity in the center and the, and the turbulence. That's what basically is why uh, the puffs split in, in, in this way. But the fundamental, you know, it's not a deterministic process. It's it's one that's driven by the turbulent uh, fluctuations. So that's probably the best I can I can do in terms of giving you a physical uh, expl explanation. It's it's it, fundamentally it's a pattern forming instability. 
Um, I, I have a question, Nigel. Um, it was really a uh, beautiful talk to, to hear and, and see, but something shocked me at the end where you were showing the soap film. I didn't see this coming. You had rough walls on both sides and you saw one kind of scaling and then you had rough wall on one side and you saw a different kind of scaling. Yes. What's that about? <laughs> so we, we spent a long time doing this. We, we used to have weekly meetings over Skype for about three hours on a Friday afternoon with the Walter Goldberg lab. So we wanted to be able to create these two types of cascade because the prediction we were trying to test is different cascades will give rise to different friction factors. And so we had to, so when you put a grid in, you almost always just get the entropy cascade, the k to the minus three. And so we tried playing around with how can we get the, how can we get the, the inverse energy cascade? And eventually we discovered that, well, why do we just take one of the walls away? So we took one of the walls away, we took out the grid, and then the, the, what happens is the sawtooth on one side creates enough, um, you know, cre creates turbulence on a small scale. And that's by the time it gets to the other wall, the, 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 uh, the energy has gone upwards in length scales, so larger and larger scales. So by measuring on the other side, you are filtering for the inverse energy cascade. And so that's how we were able, to, that's how we discovered it. And that's what, we, that's what I was showing you. Okay, I understand. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. So Arthur McKeith, you had a question you have in the chat, but maybe you want to just ask it. Uh, yeah. What was it? What was analogous to the puff splitting in the predator prey system? Yeah, I can restate that. Um, so basically, as I said, it's a pattern forming instability. So if you have a predator prey system uniformly mixed, what will happen is because of the interactions, so, you know, there's nonlinear interactions between the predator and prey, it undergoes a, an instability, which is kind of like a Turing instability. And so it'll split and then it will se separate out and then form these, these traveling waves. And so that's, that's, that's what happens in the predator prey system that happens in the, uh, in, in the turbulent system too. And the fact that you can get traveling waves in ecosystems is actually also, um, has also been, is also well known in, 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 in ecology. Nigel, so, can I, may I follow up on that a little? Does that answer your question? Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah uh, Steph, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I, I guess, could you, so I'm, I'm not familiar with the, with the waves in the ecology. So what, what would a traveling wave uh, look like in, is it just, yeah. So but basically what it looks like is this. It, it, um, I, I wish I could show you a movie of it, um, uh, but I can't quickly find it. So if you just start up with predator and prey in a spatially extended system, and they're just moving around at random, doing random walks, but, it, but when a predator eats prey, it'll uh, absorb it. So that system will self-organize into traveling waves, where what happens is this. The, 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 imagine it's sheep. So the sheep are eating grass. The grass can grow back after the sheep have gone past and the sheep are being, traced, are being chased by wolves. So imagine what's happening is that the sheep are, um, are moving. They're eating the food that gives them the energy to move. Then they're being chased by these wolves. And then behind them, the grass is growing back. That grass growing back is the analog of the shear profile of the turbulent fluid recovering behind a turbulent puff. And so this system will just initially make some random process and it's you know, very hard to see anything. But if you run that system and, and analyze it, um, you can see, it, it's not easy to see this, it will self-organize into planar waves. Um, and, 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 and they're basically waves of prey eating the grass followed by predators and they just move through the system and, and they have a characteristic length scale between those waves, which is how long it takes for the grass to grow back behind the, the sheep and, and the wolves chasing them. And so- okay. that's, and, that's clear, thank you. And, it, and, and I call them zippy waves. And why? Because the first time I saw them was that they were discovered by my daughter, Zippy, uh, when she was um, in middle school, she did a, a, a science project for her, her class and she didn't want, to, she likes computers. So she didn't want to do, you know, here's my pet rabbit running through a Kleenex box maze or something like this. So she built a, a predator prey, an evolving predator prey ecosystem. And then we just ran this in that logo. And the first thing that came out was we saw these waves and it was like, wow, you know, where do those come from? And it took me many years to understand where they, where they came from. And the time she made that discovery, it was around about the time that people theoretically started to understand where these things come from. 
Okay, so Stephanie had a question. Yeah. Um, it was kind of just following up on that. I hear from my colleagues in ecology and evolution that, you know, the, the fact that we have X many species existing in any particular ecosystem is not very well understood. And I wondered if beyond what you've shown here, if there's even more you can do with predator prey systems, where if you have nets of things that this eats that and that eats this and this eats both of them but gets eaten by this big bear yeah and you also understand stability points and more complex networks yeah people try to do that There's pe people try to understand uh, the these these food webs and um and, and there's actually a, you know a lot of literature on how do you get these complex ecosystems and in fact there was a very you know there's an inter interesting connection to turbulence because um I would say, well, I'm going to make a statement that I probably should not make in public, so I won't say that. Let me put it this way. Um, one of the great advances in ecology was made by Bob May in the 1970s, who argued, said, let's try to look at the, at the food web structure that you were just uh, describing but in, in words, where you have you know, lots of predators and prey eating each other and so on. We could describe that matrix of interactions as a random matrix. And then we could ask for the stability of the dynamical system with that. So he did that calculation. And what he found was that the more complex is the ecosystem, the less stable it is. Okay, so that revolutionized the ecology for like 30 or 40 years. And it's completely wrong. Okay, and, and, and at the time, uh, the ecologists who weren't um, intimidated by mathematics said, no, 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 that, that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And uh, but but people still, uh, you know, it's still very controversial in, in, in ecology, I would say. Now, the reason why that, that approach doesn't work is because in the real ecosystem, the matrices aren't random matrices. They are evolved matrices. They, the ecosystem has been created through evolutionary processes. And it's not true that evolution is random. It leads to structure. And we can make agent-based simulations of those things and understand what is the structure of those matrices. We don't have an analytical understanding, although it's something that I'm thinking a lot about. They, they, we don't have an un analytical understanding of what actually should be the mathematical structure of these interaction matrices that are the result of evolutionary processes. But I think one can get that, and I'm trying to do that by renormalization group. And, and, and the reason, the reason well, the, the, and, the, and the reason is that if you think about what evolution is, you start off with a probability distribution of, of phenotypes, and then there's some kind of selection. So that selection, say, says, I want to get the fastest ones, or the ones that are greenest, or the ones that can play the blues best, or something like this. So whatever your selection criterion is, you're taking some tail of the distribution. So you take those, and then you rescale that population, so now it is your entire distribution, and then you repeat the process again and again and again. So the process of what kind of distributions you get from a repeated process of, if you like, natural selection, is a problem is a fixed point problem and it's a renormalization group problem. So that's how I'm thinking about trying to understand that problem. So there's a connect there's a connection there. I mean anyway. That's I, great. That sounds like a lot of fun. I want to know more. Yeah, okay. Well I would like to, to next time I talk I'll try to tell you how 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 it, how it works. Did I answer your question? I don't even remember what the original question was, but did I answer it? Oh yes and I think you um I think it was really nice to hear your take on the Bob May result, which I've heard before, but never dug into. I've heard people say that. So. Right. Thank you. So I think well, I, yes, well, I want to make it clear. I'm not really, you know, I think what he did was it was was very important and, and helped mathematize the, these area. But I, I think, you know, I, I think in a deep level, I think it was fundamentally wrong for for these reasons. And I think many people today would say you have to do something a little a little bit more uh, sophisticated so when you look at e ecosystems you really have to worry about the evolution as well and that's a plug for my talk at the APS March meeting because when I give my talk at the APS March meeting I'll show you about some universality that we discovered in the evolutionary process um, and so I'll, I'll talk about that too but I never send, to send me the exact time because this is going to be virtual so we can all listen to Yes, I, I actually don't. I, I may have it an email. I, I don't. I don't yet know. I think they're just getting the candidate. Right. I'll, I'll try to remember to do that. 
Yeah, so we've got a lot more questions, uh, but the one person who raised a hand early uh, is Yehuda. So I should uh, uh, let Yehuda make, make sure he gets to ask. Hi, Tom. Thanks for coming. Uh, you're muted, Yehuda. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. we can. So in this um, ecological model, it's kind of known that if you have this uh, font propagating, there is a known velocity of the font, right? It's uh, yeah. the Fisher velocity and stuff like this. And you can sh yeah. also show like that if you have a carrying capacity, as you increase the carrying capacity, the velocity uh, get closer to the Fisher uh, velocity or whatever. Um, can you see anything like this when you look at experiments on yeah. turbulence? Yeah, you, you can. Although, so one thing I would say, though, is that that, that uh, uh, Komogov, Petrovsky, Piskunov, Fisher wave is, um, is a mean field wave. And, and if you have a stochastic uh, fluctuation, demographic stochasticity in the ecosystem, it strongly renormalizes that wave. So I showed you uh, how you can think of predatory ecosystems as a, as a field theory. So when you go ahead and, and write it down as a path integral and work out these waves, what you find is this. As you said, that wave goes, has a particular predicted speed and it's, it's a pulled wave. It's determined by the tail of the wave in, 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 most, in most systems like this. And that because it's determined by the tail, that's where the, 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 the um, population is smallest. And so it's most susceptible to number fluctuations, demographic stochasticity. So there's a hugely strong renormalization of those waves in real in real uh, ecosystems, which is not usually um, noticed uh, in in most ecological uh, descriptions. They're mostly just content with the mean field theory. So you do get the same thing in um, in, 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 in 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 turbulence. And actually, I didn't get get, get have time to talk about that. But if you, if you look at what happens when you go to a slightly higher Reynolds number than what I talked about, what happens is you get what's called a, a slug. Namely, you get a patch of turbulence. Let me just put on my, my own view so I can see myself. Okay, so now, okay, you can see my hands. So you get a patch of turbulence. And instead of just decaying away, like what I talked about, a split, that patch actually just grows and it has a, a wave on either side. And those are like the Fisher KPP waves. And, and we can actually calculate exactly the speed of those waves uh, and using the, the sort of mean field theory and stochastic fluctuations around it. And, and you see that in experiments. Those slugs, uh, they were measured by Björn Hoff about five years ago. And they have an, there's an interesting transition where the, the wave that's upstream and the wave that's downstream go at different speeds. And then beyond a certain Reynolds number, then they go at the same speed. And there's a reason for that, which you can understand uh, ecologically uh, very simply. And, and so that's unpublished work uh, that, that we've done. So yes, there's exact analogs of those things. So it's a, it's a great question. Okay, thanks a lot. It's a great talk, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Saab and Heinrich had kind of the same question. So Heinrich, I see you, you're live. So why don't you- uh... Hi Heinrich. <laughs> oh, that was great, that was- Fabulous, inspiring, wonderful. And uh, look, I, I just wanted to ask this one thing about um, dimensions. So, so you uh, map the two problems onto each other, the turbulence, and you showed us that turbulence occurs in various dimensions in the soap films and of course in pipes and all that. And then uh, in the mapping, now it's percolation. And I, I get it. So the transition, of course, depends on details, but the exponents should be universal. And now the question is, they depend on dimension, of course. So, so where does dimension come in here? So, the, so the dimension does come in here. So, if you if you if you look at um, um, the turbulence, say in in two in, in two dimensions. So you, you so let's suppose you you had say plane channel flow, or um, you know coet flow. So you can make a a, a model of that, um, which is. Um, called Willef flow, where you basically cut away the, the boundaries of the wall so you can do simulations better. 
So then you can you can do the experiments, numerical experiments in, in two dimensions, and 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 it maps onto two plus one dimensional DP exponents, both the exponents. Okay, and so it's always the, the dimension plus one and in, in the direct. Yes, because it, because the DP is is the space dimension plus the the time dimension, and then beyond it. And so what happens physically is when you look at the the two dimensional case, what you see is that what drives the transition very close to it is you get. Um, a kind of patch of turbulence that is surrounded by an emergent mean flow, a large scale circulation. And as you go closer and closer to the critical point, that patch breaks up into these um, kind of diagonal worms, if you want to call them like this. And as you go closer and closer, the density of those gets smaller and smaller. And where those worms come from in, in our picture is that, if, is that you have this kind of predator prey Turing instability that uh, causes a pattern, but then that interacts with the advection of the flow. And so that causes the Turing instability to be rotated. And so that's why you get these worms in this sort of cross patch pattern. Mm -hmm. And I don't have pictures to show you, but Bjornhoff is in the process of doing beautiful experiments on this and trying to measure the exponents uh, accurately in, in real system. Thanks. So that's where the dimension comes in. So maybe the last question we can have, uh, Colin, if you want to go for it. Oh yeah, uh, thank you so much for the talk. I was just wondering, um, uh, getting my head wrapped around like, uh, so these exponents and everything, it's it's contingent on the geometry of the fluid flow you're studying. You know, like a you know uh, like a channel tube or a you know a, a spinning cylinder sort of geometry. Um, uh, so do you have to start from scratch every time you want to examine a new, Well, I don't think, you know, it depends. I don't think it, so, so it, it depends on the geometry, but it, but in, in a, in not as, not as bad a way as you might think. So let's think about the pipe. So in the pipe, what happens is the shear is going longitudinally and, 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 and so, and it's described by, by one plus one direct, dimensional directed percolation. And we actually work I didn't show you. We're, we are measuring now those critical exponents um, and the universal scaling functions, and, and um, they basically agree we're, we're still finishing the work, but it seems to work. And um, if you look at the correct apparatus that I showed you, what happens there is the shear is directed uh, not in the plane, not streamwise, but perpendicular, because I've got an inner cylinder rotating, uh, an inner cylinder about which the outer cylinder is rotating. So it really just depends on the, on the dimensionality. Even the directions of the shear, the microscopic mechanisms, don't, change the, the, don't, change the, don't seem to change the critical exponents. But the phase diagram is more complicated. For example, in a pipe, the puffs interact in a way that we measured. So the, the project that we've been doing, we'll talk about it at the DFD meeting in, in, a, in a couple of weeks, is you, 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 you do experiments on pipes, uh, on puffs in a pipe, and you can measure uh, essentially very carefully the dynamics between them. So if I have a puff and it splits, you can see as, as the second one moves away, you can quantify that. And so you can measure the force law between puffs. And also you can notice that when puffs are too close to, together, this one will um, suppress the one downstream from it. And so we can characterize that. So even though it's very difficult to get a system that's big enough that you can truly measure critical behavior in the lab, we can characterize the pairwise interactions between puffs and then put those into a numerical simulation and then do that to large scale. And so extrapolate the dynamics that we've measured in the lab to work out the critical behavior. And so it turns out it, it, it's, it's, it's universal and you know, it doesn't depend too much on the, on, on, on the geometry. So, so, it's, it's, so of course, we're in early days yet. So, you know, you know, our job right now is we haven't solved turbulence, there's more to do. We have to make sure that this really works in different geometries and, and, and the experiments have to be extremely precise. They're very difficult experiments to do. So that's something that we're learning about. Thanks. Does that, does that answer your question? I think so, yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, so look, what I'd like to do now is uh, break uh, and we can stick around a little bit la after for anyone who has other questions. I said, Rio, you had a, a, a one more question, but why don't we uh, clap virtually for Nigel now and then people can leave us after go to dinner or whatever. And uh, we will. Uh... So thank you, uh, Nigel, for 
great talk and an extensive question period. I mean, so this is. I'm happy so, to uh, and I, I, I've, I think I, I think I, I luckily because of this, I was able to avoid my five o'clock meeting. So. Um, but you can stick around. So, well, I, can, so, yeah. so I think I can stick around for a, a few more minutes. Um, 